warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Every Malaysian knows Akhirul Zaman, but in English we have a more technical term, Islamic eschatology. This branch of knowledge called Islamic eschatology holds the key for explaining today's political, economic, and monetary reality. More than that, of course, but these three. Uh, to introduce Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, the best place to start is with the concept of a holy land. Which is that holy land? Is it Mecca and Medina? The Hindus have a holy land in the Banaras and uh, they also consider the whole of India or Bharat as a holy land. Do we have a concept of a holy land? Do the Jews have a concept of a holy land? Do the Christians have a concept of a holy land? <coughs> Before we proceed I seek your kind indulgence I have a cough so bear with me as I cough in between the talk yes we do and it's to be found in the Torah Christians Jews Muslims all accept the same concept of a holy land it is a land specially blessed by Allah the one God the state of Israel, this modern state of Israel that came into being in 1948, is now squatting in the Holy Land temporarily. <laughs> the Quran <laughs> refers to it as Al Ardul Muqaddasa, the Holy Land. But the modern world chooses to refer to it as Palestine because of some tribe that lived in early history in that place, the Philistine. It is a land in which Allah has ordained the truth must eventually prevail that the true religion must eventually prevail. The no rival to truth can ever take control of the Holy Land indefinitely. And it is a land in which righteousness must prevail. The Torah tells us that Allah gave the land to the Jews. What does the Quran say? In Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah of the Quran, the Quran confirms that the land was given to the Israelite people. But it was given conditionally. What are the conditions? Number one, you must uphold the truth, the true religion. And number two, you must be righteous in conduct. <coughs> Someone changed the Torah to remove this condition. And the Torah now says, it is not because of righteousness that the Lord God has given you this holy land for you are a stiff necked people the implication of this rewriting of the Torah is that the land is yours unconditionally whether you are righteous or you are wicked oppressors the land is still yours mankind must choose 
where does the truth lie in the Quran or in that uh, corrupted Torah <coughs> it's not difficult to choose because every time the Israelites violated the condition of righteousness Allah threw them out of the land and they confirm that this is what happened my book Jerusalem in the Quran has explained the subject so I can move on I don't need to explain to you how many times they violated the condition what did they do to violate the that's your homework but the last time that they violated the condition <coughs> it was when Allah had already expelled them from the Holy Land and they'd been, they had been sent to Babylon modern-day Iraq as slaves as punishment and while they were in Iraq in Babylon Allah sent prophets to them to inform them of a divine promise that Allah, <coughs> that Allah would send to them a prophet who would be their own prophet who would bring back the golden age when the holy state of Israel ruled the world from Jerusalem through the prophets David, Nabi Dawood the prophet Solomon, Nabi Suleiman ruling the world in, in the sense that there was no rival to their rule that is the sense in which they were the ruling state so that golden age would come back when the Messiah comes and when Allah did send the Messiah some of them accepted him but the rabbis rejected him they said his mother gave birth to him when she was not married and so he is when a billah min hadha a bastard and a bastard cannot be the messiah and then when they sentenced him to death for blasphemy because he claimed to be the Messiah, the son of Mary, Nabi Isa salam. And then the Roman government or the reluctant Roman government then executed the sentence. And then they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes. They were now absolutely convinced he could not have been the Messiah. Why? Why? He's dead. The golden age never came back. He never ruled the world from holy Israel. Israel is still under Roman occupation. And number two, look at how he died. He died by crucifixion. And our book, the Torah, says that whosoever dies like that is the cursed of the Lord. There's a curse upon him. So they're now convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt he could not have been the promised Messiah. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come. What they did not know and no one knew. <coughs> for some 600 years no one knew until the Quran came down. We said no they did not succeed in killing him no they did not succeed in crucifying him Allah made it appear that he was crucified how did Allah make it appear that he was crucified now kindly listen carefully not only those of you who are here in this Malaysian Airlines auditorium but those outside who will be listening to this lecture on the internet
Allah says, وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ Allah made it appear like that. For some mysterious reason, sometimes located in a book that was spirited out of the Vatican a hundred years ago, called the Gospel of Barnabas, anything that comes out of the Vatican, I'll take it with a pinch of salt. Put a little vinegar with it as well. <laughs> they, they, they hold this mysterious view that Allah, when a'uzu billah min hadha, caused someone else to assume the appearance of Jesus, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And that innocent man, who never claimed to be the Messiah, and it is irrelevant for you to come with some red herring or some cock and bull story that he did something else for which the punishment was death. That's rubbish, take it and put it in the garbage bin. I don't want to hear it. That innocent man who never claimed to be the Messiah was crucified for claiming to be the Messiah. That's an act of injustice. And Allah is not an unjust God. And so this theory of substitution must be rejected by all right thinking and clear thinking people. And we want to reject it one more time. Unqualified rejection of this nonsense. This act of injustice on the part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cause an innocent man, innocent of ever having claimed to be the Messiah, to assume the appearance of the Messiah, and then to be crucified. That is nonsense, it is rubbish, and it is an act of injustice, and those who hold this view will have to answer to Allah for it one day. I have to use this very strong language because there are those who have eyes and yet do not see and they're heading straight into the fire with this and they will not listen having disposed of this nonsense the theory of substitution well then what happened what happened does the Quran not say that it was sent to explain all things Hmm? that it is tibiyan and likulli shay in surah to nahr it explains all things so it must explain what happened how did Allah make it appear that Nabi Isa alayhi salam was crucified when he was not the answer is there in the Quran <coughs> In Surah to Ali Imran, the third surah of the Quran, and again in Surah Al Ma'idah, the fifth surah of the Quran, Allah uses the word wafat. Wafat in this context, in this context, means taking the soul. Governments don't take your soul. The World Bank can't take your soul. Only an angel can take your soul. Won't you agree with me? Only an angel. <laughs> and Allah instructs the angel to take your soul. So, in this context, the implication is that Allah took the soul of Nabi Isa Is it possible? <coughs> that he took the soul and returned it? Is that possible? In Surah to Zumar of the Quran, Allah explains, and I'm going slowly now because this is so important for Islamic eschatology. This is the pivot of Islamic eschatology. Islamic eschatology revolves around this point. In Surah Al-Zumar of the Quran, <coughs> Allah says, بَعَلَ أُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Allah يَتَوَفَّ الْأَنفُسَ حِينَ مَوْتِهَا Allah takes the souls 
at the time of Maut. Maut is death. Allah takes the souls at the time of death. Walati lam tamut fi manamiha. And those whose souls are not taken while they are awake, Allah takes the souls while you are asleep. For yumsiku lati qada alayha al maut. He then keeps those souls for whom maut is written. Death is ordained. وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ And for those for whom mouth is not yet written, Allah returns the souls. We know from this verse one form, one form, namely sleep, in which Allah does this. He takes your soul and He returns it. This may not be the only one, but this is one. That while you are asleep, he takes your souls. You have to forgive me for repeating and repeating and repeating. Because there are some people who simply cannot listen, cannot hear. So kindly forgive me. So while you are sleeping, Allah takes the soul. And if mouth is not written for you, if death is not yet ordained for you, he then returns the soul for a specific period of time in which case you did not die no that's why you are here sitting in this auditorium today <laughs> if Allah had kept the soul you would not be here you would be underneath the earth so now it is clear if Allah took the soul this is the context in which the word wafat is used in both Surah to Ali Imran and Surah to Maida. This is the context that Allah took the soul. If He took the soul and He did not return it, then Nabi Isa died. He was crucified. But Allah says, no, they did not succeed in crucifying him. They did not crucify him. They did not kill him. And so there's only one possible explanation left. And that is that after Allah took the soul, and they were now convinced that he was dead, and they took down the body, some Muslims don't want to hear that. No, because they have this fairy tale interpretation of the Quran. That no, 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 Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam was never put on the cross. I don't know where they got it from. Maybe the theory of substitution or somewhere else. Or maybe in Disneyland. But I part company from them. I part company from this uncritical position. They took the body down because they were convinced he was dead. They prepared the body for burial which is Janaza and then they put the body in a cave. They sealed the cave and there's a Roman guard outside. Then Allah returned the soul so he did not die. So the soul has been returned to the body, not to Chicago. The soul has been returned to the body. So when the soul is returned to the body, you'll wake up. You'll stand up wounded. I mean, why is this subject so difficult for some people to understand? So he's now alive. He never died. But if they know he's alive, they're going to come after him again. So then Allah raised him, body and soul, everything. Allah raised him the way he raised Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam in the Isra and Miraj, the nocturnal journey. Raising in the sense 
of taking him from this material universe into other worlds of space and time. I have no other English word to use than the word raise. And I'm allowed to use the word raise because in the Quran Allah uses the same word Bal Rafa'ahullahu ilayh. Allah raised him unto himself. Meaning that Nabi Isa <coughs> alayhi salam, the Prophet Jesus, is no longer in our world of space and time, no longer in our material universe. He has now been transported into another world of space and time, or what the Quran refers to as the Samawat. There are seven of them. And in physics they are called parallel universes. Every physicist knows about it. Ask Einstein, he'll tell you. Hmm? <coughs> Since he never experienced death, no, never experienced mouth, no. And since Allah says in the Quran, Kulu nafsin ikatul maut, every soul must taste death. It follows that Nabi Isa Islam must return. Secular scholarship may look upon us with scorn and with disdain and laugh at us for believing what the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam that one day he will return with his hands resting on the wings of two angels but they don't believe in this they think this is Disneyland so let them go their way and let us go ours and don't waste your time with them but they did not know that they thought he was dead and they know that when Allah gives his word, he keeps his word. So they're still waiting for the Messiah. Who when he comes, will rule the world. From the Holy Land, from Jerusalem. With a rule which will be eternal, meaning the end of history. I lived in New York for 10 years. <laughs> And during that time I interacted with the rabbis and with the Jews. And <laughs> I can confirm to you, oh yes, they are waiting on the Messiah. And they believe the Messiah is around the corner. We also are believing, we also believe that the Messiah is going to return. The voice of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam is the most powerful voice in history to have prophesied the return of Jesus alayhi salam. And this is the cornerstone of Islamic eschatology. Welcome to the subject of Islam and the end time. Events which are still to occur in the historical process. The most important of them all, by far, is the return of the true Messiah, the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet Jesus. That return will occur in the end time, or as we know it in Malaysia, Akhiru Zaman. And we can recognize when we are living in Akhiru Zaman. Oh, yes. And people in Kuala Lumpur, most of all, because just before Prophet Muhammad died, a very extraordinary event took place. He was sitting in the masjid with his companions when a stranger entered. No one knew who was this man. He was dressed all in white, his hair was black. And no one knew him. And he walked to the gathering and came directly in front of the Prophet and asked five questions. And the Prophet answered him and the man would confirm, yeah, you're correct in your answer. Who is he? And then he left as strangely and as mysteriously as he had arrived. And after he left, the Prophet asked, do you know who was he? Who was he? 
So we said Allah and his messenger knows but we don't. Well that was Gabriel, Jibrail Islam, who came to instruct you in your deen. One of the questions, the last question, what are the signs of Akhiru Zaman? And one of the signs that he answered and gave it, you'd find the naked barefooted shepherds competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings. That's why I said you people of Kuala Lumpur are familiar with the subject. <laughs> and, when you, and when you build your twin towers, then Korea will get jealous and put up something taller in Seoul. And then Dubai will say, no, we're going to do better. And they put up the Burj in Dubai. And then Jinda will say, we'll teach you a lesson. <laughs> And Jinda will put up towers that go up in, into the clouds. And those who see with only one eye will look at these tall buildings and say they represent progress. <laughs> these are the naked, barefooted shepherds. But those who see with two eyes will say no. What resides in the heart is far more important than the tallest of buildings that you can build. Hmm? So we are, we are living in Akhiru Zaman. If you can't see the tall buildings, please make an appointment with an eye specialist. <laughs> the the, the Akhiru Zaman or the last age is going to culminate with the return of the true Messiah, Nabi Isa alayhi islam. But Islamic eschatology has something very important to introduce now. Something which affects the political process, something which affects the world economy, something which affects the monetary system, something which explains today's strange and mysterious reality in the world today. There are those who are content to simply go to work in the morning, face the morning traffic, and go back home in the evening with your air conditioner turned on in your SUV, and then go home and cook a nice dinner, and sit down and watch television until it's time to sleep. And you do it over and over until the weekend comes. And then the weekend is the time for fun and games and so on. And for Saturday night's fever and so on. And uh, this is life. This is life. You worship the dunya. You live for the dunya. You die for the dunya. But there are others. There are others who are, more, who are made of sterner stuff. And their hearts beat with a different tune. These are people who, who yearn for something higher. Something which explains the strange world. I'm not prepared to be just another piece of balsa wood floating on the ocean. And the waves will take me wherever they want to. No. I want a boat which will take me to the port. The destination that my heart longs for. I must understand the world in which we are living today. And I must respond to it appropriately. I want peace and contentment and tranquility in my heart. And I can only get that peace and contentment and tranquility in my heart. When I understand the reality of the world in which we live. And I respond to it appropriately. And for these people we say to you today here in Malaysia and from the auditorium of Malaysian Alliance that it is the Quran and it is Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, who explained the reality of the world today as no one else can do it. And as Islamic eschatology explains the world today it is for you to now determine what are you waiting for? 
when will you come to Islam when will you come to Islam for Islam is explaining the world today the pity about it however is that the world of Islamic scholarship is not doing that the scholars of Islam are not doing that the ulama are not doing that the shuyukh are not doing that the maulanas are not doing that the muftis are not doing that that is the tragedy that we face today but the Quran is doing it and Nabi Muhammad والسلام, is doing it and it is for you to study Islamic eschatology so that through your voice mankind may accept the truth <coughs> Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said because they rejected him and they said he could not be the messiah and they're waiting for the messiah to come who when he comes would rule the world let me repeat one more time Ruling the world does not mean ruling every square inch of downtown Manhattan. No. Ruling the world means ruling with a power which cannot be challenged, which cannot be rivaled by any, any individual or combination of powers. That is the ruling state. In this sense of the word, we already have experienced two ruling states. We've experienced Britain as a ruling state. And when Britain ruled the world, Britain proclaimed that this is Pax Britannica. And then a strange thing occurred and power moved from Britain to the United States of America. And when the United States ruled the world, they did so with something called Pax Americana. Pax means peace. But this is deception. It wasn't peace. It was war and blood and oppression and deception. And so when the Messiah comes, he will rule the world. And they're waiting for him. In order for him to rule the world, he has to do it from the Holy Land. He has to do it from a state of Israel. But the problem is that Muslims are ruling the Holy Land. Up to 1917. So the Messiah will have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. When he does that, of course, Muslims are going to be enslaved in the Holy Land. The Messiah would have to do more than liberate the Holy Land. He would have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Because after they boasted of what they did to Nabi Isa Islam, we've killed him. Allah then expelled them from the Holy Land one more time. But this time he didn't send them to Babylon. This time he says, وَقَطَعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمْ And we have broken them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. And so Jews in Argentina, and Jews in Russia, and Jews in Yemen, and Jews in Morocco, and Jews in Egypt, and Jews in Iraq and Iran, and Jews in China as well. <coughs> and we have broken them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. This is divine punishment. But with a diabolical cunning, they, des they describe it differently. They say this was Allah's way of getting the, the truth to reach four corners of the world. Not accepting that this was punishment. And when <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And when Allah expelled them for the last time after the alleged crucifixion of Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Allah then said in Surah Al Isra, Wa in 
Hudna. If you return to this holy land with your wickedness and oppression, your violation of the condition of righteousness, we will return with our punishment. Every time you violated the condition of righteousness, we threw you out of the holy land. If you come back one more time, we'll throw you out again. But the, <coughs> the Messiah, if he is to fulfill <coughs> the prophecy of ruling the world, number one would have to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. Number two, he'd have to bring them back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Number three, he'll have to restore the state of Israel. And number four, he'll have to cause that Israel to become once again the ruling state in the world. Only then can the Messiah stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. <coughs> so they're waiting for that Messiah to come. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is the most powerful voice in the world to have explained that Allah created a being a wujud and programmed that being to <coughs> impersonate the Messiah He is known as Al Masih al Dajjal, Dajjal, the false Messiah. And when Allah releases him into the world, this is what he'll do. He will liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. He's already done that. He's already done that. He will bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He's already done that. While we were eating Roti Chanai and drinking Te Tarik, he's already done that. He will restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land, an Israel that will be an imposter, but convince them that this is Holy Israel. He's already done that. He has already done that. Don't ask me, Sheikh Imran, where is the hadith? Don't ask me, because these are logical deductions. Do not ask me, where is the hadith for what you are saying? Go find some other teacher to teach you and leave me alone. You can't understand. These are logical deductions. And yet they ask, where is the hadith? <laughs> ah, yes. He's already done that. He's already restored the state of Israel in the Holy Land. An imposter Israel. And convinced them that this is Holy Israel. Only one thing now remains. Only one. He has to cause that Israel to rule the world. And it is in the process of bringing that Israel to the position of ruling the world and analyzing how he has done it. Because we are just around the corner now. We will understand today's political reality. We'll understand political history. We'll understand today's world economy. We'll understand economic history. We'll understand Bretton Woods and the monetary system which came out of Bretton Woods. We'll understand the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. We'll understand the introduction of bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currencies and what is the role which they have played 
after they took the gold dinar and silver dirham out of the market and then did something that even Dr. Mahathir was not aware of. The Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund prohibit the use of gold as money. Dr. Mahathir did not know that. Our scholars of Islam don't appear to be even interested in the subject, much less to study it. <coughs> so when we study what is the strategy being used to bring Israel to that position where it can rule the world, we will understand the reality of today's politics and economics and monetary economics and other things besides the feminist revolution as well. Before we proceed to that political history and economic history, <coughs> let me step back for a moment. A companion of the Prophet والسلام, whose name was Tamim al-Dari came to the Prophet والسلام, in Medina and narrated something to him. And the Prophet والسلام, then said to the people, sit down. Tamim al-Dari has come to me and told me something about Dajjal which confirms what I have been speaking to you about. And this hadith is located in Sahih Muslim. And here is the event. <coughs> when I analyze the event, I come to the conclusion that this was a vision. But when I give my opinion, don't you dare accept my opinion. No. I don't want you to accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct. Other than that, you will not be showing respect for your own rational faculty. I never did that with my own teacher. I gave him more trouble than every other student combined. I never accepted anything that he taught me until I was convinced that it was correct. That's the way he trained me. So I won't be simply a parrot. Uh, someone who came out of a Molana factory. <laughs> and that's what I want from my students. This is my <coughs> opinion that it was a vision, not an actual event, a vision. In the question and answer session, you may ask me, well, how did you come to that conclusion? Tamim Mudari and some 40 of his companions went on board a ship. Uh, and ships normally travel in water. I don't know about Malaysia. So you have to look for a body of water. It's logical deduction. Eh? And you're leaving from the Arab world. The Arab world. And that part of the Arab world where Medina is located, to the north is Jerusalem. So you have the Mediterranean Sea. And then on this side you have the Red Sea. <coughs> but a storm came and blew the ship for a whole month. So we eliminate the Red Sea. Because if a storm comes and you're in the Red Sea within five minutes, you reach land. But this, day, this one took a whole month before it reached land. So we, we eliminate the Red Sea. <coughs> and then they came to an island. They came to an island. And I, I recognize that island to be the island of Britain. But some people, they can't understand how can a ship travel through the Mediterranean Sea and reach Britain? Or, well how come the US Navy and US merchant ships, since the United States was born 200 something years ago, with trading with North Africa. <laughs> huh? 
Lots of American ships used to be trading with North Africa. Where did they, how did they get into the Mediterranean? Mm -hmm. So it is possible to get out of the Mediterranean with a ship. Elementary geography. I recognize the island to be Britain, but don't accept my opinion until you're convinced that it is correct. There are some who are convinced otherwise. They think the island is Singapore. <coughs> when they landed on this island, they got on shore and they were confronted by a very hairy creature. So much hair that you could not tell which side was head and which side was tail. Much like in lower Manhattan, you can't tell who is a man and who is a woman. Hmm? So you couldn't tell which side was head and which side was tail. <laughs> and then this creature is called Jessasa, meaning a spy. So this is an island located about one month's journey by sea using wind <coughs> from the Arab world, uh, the Mediterranean coast there by Syria. And it is an island with expertise in spying and espionage, you know. A hint for you, James Bond kind of stuff. And Jasasa pointed to the ruins of a monastery and said, there's someone waiting for you there. So this is an island in which religion will eventually crumble and churches are going to be sold, restaurants and uh, discotheques and bingo halls. Church is on sale, because nobody going to church. Hmm? And uh, so they hurried. And when they got to the ruins of the monastery, they found this human being. He looks like a human being. <coughs> but he's in chains. His hands are chained to his neck. And his feet are chained together. And he questions them. And they are very interesting questions for that you must read this book and then he said I am Dajjal I am Dajjal and when I am released so up to this point in time he's not as yet been released this is about the second or third year after the Hijra in Medina when I am released, I'll enter every town and every city, but he didn't mention Kampu. Did you hear that? He said, I'll enter every town and every city, including Kuala Lumpur, but he didn't mention Kampu. For our audience outside of Malaysia, Kampu means village. So protection from the Jal is better in the village, in Kampung, than in the city. So when the Jal is released, it will be from this island that he is going to commence his effort to rule the world from Jerusalem, from the Holy Land. Hmm? Which island is it? <coughs> I came to the conclusion that it was Britain. The Prophet said Islam, that when Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. Don't make the mistake of counting 40 days as one month and 10 days or one month and 11 days. No. Don't do that. Someone asked the Prophet which was the first masjid which was built? He said the one in, the, in Arabia, the Kaaba, by Ibrahim mm. And then someone asked him which was the second masjid which was built by a Prophet? He said the one in Jerusalem, Masjid Al-Aqsa, by Suleiman and then he was asked, how much time elapsed between the construction of the two? He said, 40 years. He said, 40 years. When every single Arab, 
every single Arab in Arabia would know that it is far 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 more than 40 years but thousands of years in between obviously when he said 40 years he's speaking symbolically symbolically hmm? so when he says that Dajjal will live on earth for 40 days do not take it literally please the 40 days he says one day would be like a year he didn't say one day would be a year did he he said one day would be like a year one day would be like a month and one day would be like a week <coughs> and all the rest of his days would be like your days so they subtract 3 from 40 strange mathematics and they get 37 so they said when he is in our day like a year uh, sorry our day like his day he's going to live for 37 days how can you be born and you still in your diaper after 37 days still drinking your mother's milk and yet become a young man powerfully built curly hair huh? because your mathematics is wrong <laughs> no it's not to be counted as 40 it is symbolic language one day like a year would be stage one of his mission which lasts for a long time one day like a week like a month would be stage two which would be a shorter period of time and one week one day like a week would be the shortest period and it is only after these three stages have been completed only then only then would Dajjal appear in our material universe in our world of space and time only then would we be able to see him prior to that you can't see him he's released he's here but you can't see him are there angels in this auditorium apart from your wife of course yes we have angels on our shoulders can you see the angels no but they are here they are here but you can't see them are there jinn in this auditorium hmm? I know there are lots of them in Washington but are there jinn in this auditorium yes they are can you see them no you can't similarly Dajjal is released he is here but you can't see him until stage one stage two and stage three have been completed and he enters into our world of space and time a Malay artist did the cover design of this book and you see three circles and the three circles represent the three stages of the job and we recognize that in stage one a day like a year Britain became the ruling state of the world we did not say that Britain was a ruling state for the whole of stage one we never said that so don't come with the nonsense of saying what year did Britain become a ruling state and what year was transferred power transferred to the United States so we can calculate <laughs> when Israel will become the ruling state I am not a part of that you do your mathematical, mathematical conclusions and when you finish take it somewhere don't bring it to me no it's stage one which lasted for a long time stage one witnessed the emergence of Britain as a ruling state Britain <laughs> becomes a ruling state with a mysterious relationship with the Holy Land hmm? it is the British army which defeats the Ottoman Islamic army and takes control of Jerusalem it is Britain which issues the Balfour Declaration and if you don't know what's the Balfour Declaration do your homework 
It is Britain which rule over the Holy Land with a mandate conferred by the League of Nations from 1917, 1918 to 1948. It is Britain which presided over the birth of the State of Israel in 1948. And so we are convinced that the island is Britain. But if you choose to believe it's Singapore, that's your choice. And then came stage two, which is a day like a month. And we recognize that Dajjal has now created a second ruling state. And that second ruling state is the United States of America with a mysterious relationship with Israel which cannot be explained by normal tools of political analysis. No. Hmm? <coughs> and then comes stage three when power will be transferred from the United States of America to a third ruling state. And we say that that third ruling state would be Israel. And that is where we are located now in the historical process. Only, only, only Islamic eschatology can deliver that statement. Only the Quran and Nabi Muhammad could explain this political process. We are now located at that moment. When was Dajjal released then? Let's step back again. Nabi Muhammad suspects a Jewish boy in Medina to be Dajjal. And he takes Omar with him to question the boy. But the boy is rather impertinent and rude in his answers. And Omar gets angry. O Messenger of Allah, give me permission, I'll cut off his head. The Prophet replies and he says, No, Umar, don't do that. If he is Dajjal, if he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. But we are being given a message in these words. If he is Dajjal, it's not possible. You cannot speak these words if Dajjal is still in chains. This one is not in chains. <laughs> Implying that Dajjal has been released. He's not saying that this is Dajjal, no. The boy's name was Ibn Sayyad. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. And if he's not, it will be sinful to kill him. So this incident is meant to tell us that the Dajjal has been released. There is a difference between release and khuruj. The hadith uses the word khuruj for another event. Listen to this hadith, which is in the Sunan of Abu Dawood. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, he said, Umran, Umran ubayt al-Maqdis, kharabu yathrib. At that time, when Jerusalem would be a booming city with construction, construction everywhere, booming, flourishing, center stage. That would be the time when Yathrib, meaning Medina to Nabi, would be in a state of kharab. Number one, a state of forlorn desolation. That's one meaning. Playing no role whatsoever in Islamic affairs and no role whatsoever in world affairs, a forgotten city. But the other meaning, I think it's a sheikh from Jordan who drew my attention to it. He said, as buildings are going up over there, buildings are being destroyed here. The strange Wahhabi cult, which emerged in Saudi Arabia to become an ally of the Zionists, 
to such an extent that Saudi Arabia is today a strategic ally of Israel. They destroy every single building in Medina which has a sacred history attached to it. So as buildings are going up here, buildings are being destroyed here. Mm -hmm. So when that time comes, then Kharabu Yatrib Khurujul Malhama. Look at that time for the Great War. The Great War, they call it Armageddon. The Prophet called it Malhama. It's a great war which will make the First World War and the Second World War look like a fight over peanuts. That's how great it's going to be. <coughs> My reading is that the Great War or the Malhama will cause a substantial reduction in the population of the world. So that what remains of the population of the world after the Malhama would be manageable for Israel, <laughs> in order for Israel to rule the world. Mm -hmm. So if you have 8 billion people in the world today, you might have half a billion after that. Seven and a half have gone to another world when the Malhama takes place. That's where we are now. The next thing, the next thing to occur is the Malhama. If Turkey attacks Syria and invades Syria, as I am expecting, and if Russia then comes to the defense of Syria, as I am expecting, well, NATO will get what NATO wants. NATO wants a big war. Well, what's what you want? That's what you'll get. And that is going to lead to the Malhama nuclear war which will substantially reduce the population of the world this is islamic eschatology at work telling you what's coming anticipating the future not fortune telling what mr reagan had in the white house no <laughs> this is an anticipation of events to come based on islamic eschatology and then he said Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. But when the Great War takes place, it will lead to the conquest of Constantinople. Every Turk knows that Sultan Muhammad Fatih conquered Constantinople in the year 1453. And the world of Islam was led by its nose to accept the falsehood that that conquest of Constantinople in 1453 is the fulfillment of the hadith prophesying a Muslim conquest of Constantinople. That's false. There's a little booklet outside, only about 30 pages long, called Medina Returns to Center Stage in Akhir Zaman. And that little booklet examines this conquest of Constantinople, which is to come, which is to come. We can discuss it in greater detail in the question and answer session. Fathul Constantinia Khurujud Dajjal, said the Prophet So it is only after Constantinople has been conquered by the Muslims, which is still to come, which will bring an end to NATO control over the city, and once NATO control over Constantinople is gone, then the Bosphorus will be open for the Russian Navy to pass through and enter into the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. It is only then that Dajjal will have his khuruj. I mean, only now will Dajjal will appear in human form. Only now will you see him ruling over the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And when he rules over the state of Israel, one of the last things he's going to do is to attack Medina. And the Israeli armed forces are going to land outside of Medina with Dajjal. This is explained in that little booklet. It's only about 30 pages long. No excuse for not reading it. But the angels are going to bar him from entering Medina. 
and then Medina is going to shake three times three times I don't know what the Islamic University of Medina is going to do on that day Medina is going to shake three times and every kafir and every munafik kafir a disbeliever munafik a hypocrite will be thrown out and they will join the job and since he is not allowed to enter Medina he will di divert it to Damascus and then all three will be in Damascus all three the three most important actors in Akhiru Zaman all three will be in Damascus at the same time Imam al-Mahdi will be there Dajjal will be there <laughs> and Dajjal is outside the masjid and the Imam is inside the masjid and the confrontation is about to take place and history repeats itself in the same way that we were approaching the water fleeing with Moses alayhis salam and the army of Fir'aun was approaching behind and the confrontation is about to take place and some of us are in a state of despair at that last moment Allah says to Musa alayhi salam strike the water with your rod and the water parted what is فَرَقْنَ بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ and we parted the water for you فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ and we delivered you to safety وَأَغْرَقْنَ آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْزُرُونَ and we destroyed Pharaoh and his army and it happened before your very eyes hmm? similarly history repeats itself that Imam al-Mahdi is inside the masjid and Dajjal is outside waiting for the confrontation and at that very last moment Allah sends Nabi Isa alayhi salam back and he comes down into the masjid and the Imam sees him and says this is the son of Mary the way John the Baptist said here he is this is the man you've been waiting for this is the Messiah history repeats itself Nabi Isa alayhi salam is invited you lead the prayer he said no you've been pointed the Imam you lead the prayer so the Imam leads the prayer the Salat and he prays with us Muslims the way we pray bowing down prostrating that the head will touch the dust of the earth in worship and after the salat is over he says open the gates because the masjid is barricaded and as he steps out the child will see him and the jal out of fear will melt the way salt melts in water and he'll flee so today you are stamping your bloody feet in the holy land pulling up walls of apartheid looking down upon us as cockroaches we are not human, we are subhuman, you are the chosen people heaven is reserved for you not all Jews are like that, no not all Jews are like that there are Jews who will stand with us in a common fight against oppression and those Jews are welcome to come and live with us in our Muslim villages but the other Jew who is an oppressor on that day you will be running and Nabi Isa will pursue him and overtake him with a place called Lud and kill him and after that Gog and Magog will be destroyed by Allah and that, <coughs> that is an important subject to study of Akhir zaman Gog and Magog and I have a book on the subject outside and then a Muslim army will liberate the Holy Land a Muslim army will liberate the Holy Land 
and truth will triumph over falsehood and righteousness will triumph over oppression and wickedness and that's how history will end I got an email from a supporter of the state of Israel about a week ago a very politely worded email inviting me to a reasoned dialogue why are you Muslims unable and unwilling to recognize that we Jews do have rights? And my response was, I regret it is not possible for me to have a friendly dialogue with a supporter of the State of Israel. And my prophet has spoken of a day when the stones are going to speak in the Holy Land. And so I prefer that the stones should speak with you. That was my answer to him. Mm -hmm. But we have to go back now, having given you this tour of Islamic eschatology. We have to go back now to the strategy. How is Dajjal going to achieve his objective of getting the state of Israel to rule the world? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you have to achieve political rule over the world. How to achieve political rule over the whole of mankind? Answer, you have to bring a new political system and get that political system to replace all, all existing political systems in the world. And that's why you had something called Western imperialism and western armies colonizing the rest of the world in order to dismantle and to destroy every other political system so that when you have something called decolonization you would leave in place when you decolonize your political system and that political system was constructed on the unit of a state. A modern state. And this state is now secular. In what sense of the word is it secular? Oh, prior to the modern West, all societies recognize divine sovereignty. Even primitive peoples, previous civilization, they recognize sovereignty located above. In the case of the Christian world, God is sovereign, but he created the church, and the church is his representative. Hmm? The Hindus also had the concept of divine sovereignty. The Buddhists, they also have a concept of God after Buddha had left. And us Muslims, we had the Khilafah state, which recognized Allah as Al-Malik, the sovereign. If you recognize, <coughs> if you recognize other than Allah as sovereign, you commit a sin called shirk but the Malay say shirk that's laziness eh? shirk it is the one sin that Allah will not forgive he's, pre he's prepared to forgive all sins in Allah yaghfiru zunuba jamia Allah forgives all sins tell my servants if you come to me with sins as high as the sky, I will forgive them all. Don't come with shirk. And this is shirk. Not only does this new state refuse to recognize divine sovereignty, it says the state is sovereign. The state is Al-Malik, not Allah. And so too with supreme authority. Allah is no longer Al-Akbar, the state is Al-Akbar. Not only that, <coughs> Allah is no longer the supreme lawgiver, Al-Hakam. The state 
is the supreme lawgiver. Allah can make something haram, the state can make it halal. And Allah can make it halal and the state can make it haram. To make halal what Allah made haram is shirk. Surah to Tawbah. To make haram what Allah made halal is shirk. To make halal what Allah made haram is shirk. And the modern state now comes into being and it makes halal every single thing that Allah made haram. There's nothing left. Did you hear Obama just speak recently? That he supports the legalization of the marriage of a man with another man? Did you hear that? And yet everybody wants a ticket to Washington. Everybody wants a green card. Do they have the rational faculty of a donkey? Huh? Is this what the world has come to? They have eyes and yet cannot see, they have ears and yet cannot hear, they have hearts and yet cannot understand and they dance to every single tune the Dajjal plays. They dance to every single tune that the Dajjal plays. That's the world today. That's the political reality. And then you take the system of secular states because they do not recognize divine sovereignty. So secular. They take the system of secular states and introduce them into an international organization called the League of Nations and then the United Nations. And so you are uniting the world in one political system. And you have the Security Council with supreme authority. If war breaks out between two parties and the Security Council says stop fighting, you've got to stop. You don't have authority to continue. If you attempt to continue then the Security Council has the right to demand of every single member state to send troops so that an international troops, international force is, re is established to go and fight you. And when you are called upon you have to obey. That's what the state, the status is, uh, the Security Council is. And so once you had the United Nations established with the Security Council, not Charter, you have established the foundations for world government. And when that world government is achieved, then the Dajjal will rule over it. And what we are witnessing now, particularly in Europe, but the Europeans don't understand, is the, is the demolition of the modern state, the demolition of the modern state with its authority so that a world government can emerge which will rule over all of mankind. That is the fundamental explanation of political events taking place in the world now. <coughs> they did the same thing with the economy. Allah had prohibited riba, borrowing and lending money on interest. Sometimes a money lender lends you money on interest in order that your loss would be his gain. You see, normal people do business. And as every businessman knows, when you do business, you take chances. There's risk involved in business. A good businessman will try to minimize his risk. But every businessman knows that you cannot eliminate risk. So in business you can make a profit or you can suffer loss. And once you embrace risk, then Allah can intervene to take from some and give to others. 
And so Allah distributes and redistributes wealth. It's not the function of governments to distribute or to redistribute wealth because that corrupts the market. But the money lender does not want to suffer loss. No. <laughs> so the money lender lends his money on interest. And come rain or sunshine, you got to pay his interest. It doesn't matter whether you are suffering loss or not, you got to pay his interest. So foolproof, guaranteed <laughs> return on his investment with no loss. And in the event that you do not repay, he makes sure that there's something called a mortgage, security. So he can take his pound of flesh. You recognize the pound of flesh, don't you? No? Never heard about that Englishman who was a great sheikh? Huh? The Englishman who was a very great sheikh wrote the best book on riba you can ever find. It's called Merchant of Venice. What was his name? Shakespeare. William Shakespeare. And in it he has riba as a pound of flesh. I mean that's brilliance. That's literary brilliance on the part of Shakespeare. Masha'Allah. He was really a sheikh, wasn't he? <laughs> so sometimes he lends you money on interest in order that his wealth would increase constantly without ever loss. And his gain is your loss. But there are other times when he lends you money on interest not because he wants to become richer but because he wants to enslave you. And if you have not understood it do please read John Perkins. If I had written the book they wouldn't believe me. But when John Perkins wrote the book they could not ignore it. Confessions of an economic hit man. Do please read that book. This is why Allah has prohibited riba. Because riba is like poison. Once it's injected into your system, it will do to you what it did to the Ottoman Islamic Empire. Hmm? It will enslave you, it will paralyze you until it can destroy you. So they have done that with the banking system around the world. Today's banking system was created by Dajjal. And today's banking system has fulfilled its functions splendidly. It has been an unqualified success in impoverishing and enslaving all those who are resisting Dajjal. And delivering wealth, unsurpassed wealth, to all those who bow down and worship the job. So if you're living on the gravy train, if you're living in an economy that is prospering at this time, you must know you're worshipping the job. <laughs> and if you're in Indonesia or in Bangladesh or in Egypt or in Pakistan or in most of Africa, you'll know you're being punished because you are resisting the job. Hmm? They don't teach this in the classrooms of economics. But the Prophet said that the Dajjal will come to a people and if they accept him and follow him he'll cause the rain to fall. And the animals will come back home in the evening with their humps high and giving so much milk and the people will prosper. And the Jah will go to another people and they would resist him. And he will stop the rain from falling. And they will suffer drought and hardship. And the animals will come back home in the evening lean with no milk. And they would starve. This is the language with which the Prophet ﷺ explains today's economic reality. True riba. But that was not all. 
I told you earlier, you cannot explain without the jal. <coughs> Today's monetary reality. You cannot explain without the jal. Today's monetary reality. Allah speaks of money in the Quran. Oh yes. In the Quran you'll find dinar. In the Quran you'll find dirham. A dinar in the Quran is a gold coin. A dirham in the Quran is a silver coin. Hmm? This is money in the Quran. And in the Hadith you have not only dinar and dirham but <coughs> excuse me when there is a shortage of gold and silver coins in the market then in Medina they would use dates as money you call it korma they would use dates as money or wheat or barley or salt but they will use in a substitute for gold and silver they'll use an article of food consumption so you can't ban it can you an article of food consumption which is in abundant supply in the market no shortage which has a shelf life not like mangoes this can last for some time and which has its value inside of it not outside so George Soros can play games with it uh -huh. it has intrinsic value this is money in Islam this is money in the Sunnah this is halal money and when we build our Muslim villages this is what we want to do to bring back that sunnah money so that our transactions may be halal but what they did after they colonized us was to bring in their bogus and fraudulent money paper money what's the value of a paper currency paper note the value of one piece of paper is equivalent to another piece of paper. Full stop. You don't need a PhD in mathematics for that. Huh? Then how can you tell me that this piece of paper, this piece of paper has the value of Roti Chennai? I can't understand that. And that other piece of paper, you just change the color and put a number. And that piece of paper has a value of a BMW. Huh? Do I look like someone with the brains of a donkey? Huh? You just have to change the color and change the number on it. Huh? And you can change the value of the piece of paper. Are you a magician? And if anyone wants to challenge me, do please remember, I have studied international monetary economics. I've done it at two universities, so I do have some knowledge of what I'm talking about. That's where your paper money is today. That's where your paper money is today. And <laughs> if you would go to the internet and look up for my lectures, on the gold dinar and silver. Oh, and there's also a booklet outside on the subject. The gold dinar and silver dirham, uh, Islam and the future of money. And we do have some dinar and dirham outside? Yes. Yeah, we do. We have some dinar and dirham outside. So you could take it up and feed it. Your grandfather used to feed it. <laughs> and now you don't ever touch a dinar and dirham. We have some outside. And so they brought this bogus monetary system and got the whole world hooked on it so they printing paper and we printing paper everybody printing paper but there's a difference I was addressing a conference in Brunei with Islamic scholars from different parts of the world 
and I made a joke and nobody laughed. <laughs> so I found it strange. How come nobody laughed? And these are scholars of Islam. And I realized they didn't have any knowledge of the subject. I said, when the Europeans and the Americans and the Australians and so on, when they print their paper, they have a secret chemical and they dip the paper in the chemical and it comes out as hard currency. And we don't have the secret chemical. So ours is not hard currency. Nobody laughed. Perhaps they actually believed that there was this secret chemical. <laughs> and these are scholars of Islam. Hmm? You make a joke and nobody laughs. Yes, <laughs> this is the bitter reality. That you could print a US dollar and take it anywhere in the world. And you can buy whatever you want. So long as the donkeys accept the paper, you can buy all the oil of Saudi Arabia free of charge. All that you need is paper and ink and a printing press. This is where the Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, is today. All that you need is paper and ink and a printing press. Because the scholars of Islam do not understand monetary economics. Because the institutions of learning don't teach the subject. And yet they give fatwa. And yet they give fatwa. Defending it. When we print our paper and you take a basket full of Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi taka, to Midtown Manhattan, you can't even buy a cup of coffee. Nobody wants it. So you have a system of ripping off the rest of the world. And you becoming richer and richer and richer and richer. While Indonesia becomes poorer and poorer and poorer and poorer. A financial system. There is a den of a house of th a den of thieves. I've given you the mountain tops, a brief survey, an introduction of Islamic eschatology, the main actors in Islamic eschatology. I didn't have time to deal with Gog and Magog, and then I took you to the main focus of Islamic eschatology. Namely, the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And then introduce to you Dajjal, the false messiah. And then showed to you the difference between his release and his khuruj. That he was released in the lifetime of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, But his khuruj will come only after the conquest of Constantinople which is around the corner, maybe 10 years, 15 years from now. <coughs> I have explained to you his political strategy, bringing to, into being the new concept of a state, the Republican state, which is secular. What I did not mention to you is that Islamic scholarship failed and failed miserably in recognizing the modern state as based on shirk and therefore that elections to form government in these states would involve you in shirk and you'll hardly find any scholar of Islam today anywhere in the world very very few who will stand up and say to the believers, do not go and vote for that substitute for the Khilafah and validate that substitute for the Khilafah and enter into shirk. Do not do it. Rather stay faithful with Allah and his messenger. 
stay faithful with the Khilafah state, struggle for the restoration of the Khilafah state, which recognizes Allah as sovereign, which recognizes Allah's authority as supreme, which recognizes Allah's law as the supreme law. What Allah has made halal, you enforce it as halal. What Allah has made haram, you enforce it as halam, haram. We know that that is not going to come until Imam al-Mahdi. But even so, we still struggle for it. Iqbal, one of the most outstanding Islamic scholars of this age, Muhammad Iqbal, was deceived. He was a great scholar. I honor him, I respect him. Consider him to be one of my teachers, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. And yet he declared that the modern Republican state with its parliament is an adequate substitute for the Khilafah. And that's why Pakistan is in a mess today. I know Pakistanis don't like it when I speak like this. It is no disrespect to Dr. Iqbal. No. If Imran Hussein makes a mistake and he's in his grave, I want his students to correct him. It will be no disrespect to me that you correct me. And so it is no disrespect to Iqbal when I say that this was a mountain of a mistake. I've taken you on a tour of the modern secular state and the system of states, the United Nations and the Security Council to show you where we're moving in the direction of world government so that Dajjal can rule the world from Jerusalem. Then I took you to the economy and to the enslavement of all those who resist Dajjal so that through the economy he can also establish his rule over mankind and those who resist him will be powerless to do anything about it. And then I took you to the monetary system and I show you the systemic, systemic enslavement of mankind through ripping them off with paper money that is bogus and fraudulent and haram. What do we do? The answer is, Allah says, can they possibly be equal? Those who have knowledge and those who don't? Can they possibly be equal? We have in this gathering a sister who took the Shahada in France six months ago. And after six months she's here in Malaysia to get knowledge, to get knowledge. Are they possibly equal, those who are content to eat roti chanai and drink tetaric? And those whose hearts hunger for truth and for knowledge? No, they can't be equal. And so the message of this gathering today is to devote your attention now to the study of El Mu'akhiru Zaman the study of Islamic eschatology because it is only Islamic eschatology that can explain the political and economic and monetary reality of the world today and if you have the Quran and you have the Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam and you do not study Islamic eschatology you will pay the price for it we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may put into your heart a restlessness which will never leave you so that for the rest of your lives you'll be devoted to the pursuit of knowledge to understand the world and when you understand the world to then respond to it appropriately Ameen Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tuba alina ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya arham rahimin Ameen The question is what is my understanding of what constitutes economic process, uh, economic progress? And is economic progress something important for the future of the Ummah? Good. Allah speaks in the Quran 
and history tells us as well that an army constituted of refugees constituted of refugees no state of the armor state of the art armor no horses only two hardly any camels only 315 or so men and they had to face an army of 1000 the rich people's army a good economy prosperous economy state of the art armor lots of horses lots of camels says Allah in the Quran how many times has it happened that a small force defeated a big force <coughs> today we are poor our enemies are wealthy Saudi Arabia is wealthy Qatar is wealthy but they have joined the side of the enemy and those who are resisting a poor but that is no reason for us to lose heart that the poor can still triumph with Allah's help so a sound economy is not a guarantee that you would succeed in the military struggle the armed struggle of resistance against oppression that's the first point we want to make what <coughs> constitutes economic progress for us economic progress is measured by the level of suffering in the society not by how many billionaires there are and how many millionaires there are but what is the level of suffering in a society we want to see a distribution of wealth in a society that is fair and equitable and that no one is without basic necessity basic necessities of life food and clothing and shelter a single mother she's divorced and he's gone found another girl a younger one prettier one and left her with the children and she has to walk the street to look for a job to earn a livelihood to feed her children if that's your economy it's not ours in our economy <laughs> in our economy we must have economic provisions she does not have to look for a job her husband is dead she doesn't have to look for a job no woman no woman in our economy has to look for a job to feed herself and her children none 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 that's the difference between us and you she has the right to pursue economic activity she can be a businesswoman sure but the society the economy has a duty to her to ensure that she and the children have basic necessities of life without having to seek employment for us that's economic progress there are others in the society who are disabled cannot work who are ill cannot work <coughs> we don't leave them on the streets and dismantle social security we don't create insurance companies <laughs> so you have to buy an insurance policy our insurance policy is a jama'ah every single member of the jama'ah has a responsibility to those who are disabled to those who are ill to those who are in need that's a healthy economy 
not an economy in which wealth constantly, constantly revolves only amongst the wealthy. And they grow richer and richer. <coughs> and the rest of the economy is sinking into greater and greater poverty and destitution. That's not a healthy economy. All those who follow Dajjal today are doing that. They boast of a healthy economy. How much do you pay her? Why are you running away now? Come back, come back, come in the hall. Don't run. How much are you paying her? The Indonesian maid. She's the first to wake up in the morning. She's the last to sleep at night. She has to leave her husband and her children in Indonesia and come here and pick up your garbage. She works all day like a donkey and at the end of the day she's paid the wage of a donkey. Is that a healthy economy? How much do you pay the Bangladeshi worker? How much do you pay the Indonesian worker? in a prosperous economy. I'm asking you Singapore, I'm asking you because you are the model. Don't be annoyed when I call your name Singapore. I have the right to do that because you are pre presented to the world as a model economy. How many million Indonesian women have worked in Singapore as maids so you can be prosperous, so your wife can go out for dinner every night? in some fancy restaurant while the maid is there to take care of the home and the children and under the age at the end of the month you pay her the wage of a slave shame on you shame on you shame is that economic progress so this is a different way of looking at the subject than is taught at the harvard school of business how should we respond appropriately in order to be successful in our response to the political and economic and monetary challenges. Is that the question? Yes. It is. When you've abandoned the Quran and someone comes to you and points out to you, you have abandoned the Quran. When you've abandoned the Sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and someone comes to you and tells you this is what you have done and you recognize it, then what should you do? The answer is you must make tawbah. Tawbah means to turn around. To turn away from that and to turn to Allah and His Messenger. You would have been doing that a long ago. All of you. This Ummah would have been doing that if the scholars of Islam had done their job. The reason why we are failing and failing and failing, constantly failing, is because the scholars of Islam have failed and failed miserably. Fail on the political front, on the economic front, on the monetary front. And so my answer to you is, we need a new generation of scholars of Islam. We cannot get that new generation of scholars of Islam with our existing institutions of Islamic learning. No. We have to create a new world of Islamic scholarship. I'm hoping and praying that the internet can help us as our message reaches the young people in different parts of the world. That they may grow tomorrow to be the scholars of Islam who will lead the Ummah back to the Quran and to the Sunnah. Okay, is it possible that part of the strategy for bringing about a substantial reduction in the population of the world could be a medical attack. Change the word medical, put the word biological. <laughs> biological. Yes, you're right. The Prophet said, Islam, the Arabs are going to be wiped out by plague. Long ago they used the word plague. Now we use the word epidemics, epidemics, hmm? like uh, swine flu virus, like is it H1V1 is called, am I correct? 
Huh? H1N1. H1N1 or whatever it is. <coughs> these are AIDS, these are viruses. Some of them manufactured in laboratories. <laughs> yes. uh, he said the Arabs are going to be wiped out by plague. That destruction of the Arabs is coming. It has not come as yet. The world is going to see biological warfare being waged to effect a substantial reduction in the population of the Arab world. Hmm? He said that at that time when plague attacks the Arabs that neither plague nor Dajjal can enter Medina. I don't know. Check the, check the booklet at the back. Medina returns to center stage. You'll get the hadith there. It is either Medina and Makkah or, or Medina alone. I can't remember now. <coughs> and so once the biological warfare starts, you will see Arabs flocking to Makkah and Medina in order to survive, not to die. Because the Arabs are going to die the way sheep die in a plague, said the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? Neither Dajjal nor plague can enter Makkah and Medina. And so if you're in Makkah and Medina, you'll survive. And if not, you're most likely going to die. At that time, Makkah and Medina are going to return to center stage in the world. Because Nabi Muhammad wasalam, said that this is going to happen and look, it is happening now. So biological warfare is coming and it's going to be spectacular and it will validate the truth in Islam. Well, I did mention earlier that Dajjal said to Tamim Muddari that when I'm released I'll enter every town and every city. But he didn't mention Kampung. He didn't mention villages. And so there is greater security. There are greater chances for survival. For example, from biological warfare that's coming. If you're living in the remote countryside, in small communities, the bigger the city, the less your chances of survival. And so Dajjal has been causing the countryside to be vacated. And all of the countryside is <laughs> moving to the city. And he does that through the economic weapon of riba. Hmm? You can only get a job here. I met this man from Terengganu. <coughs> His wife lives in Terragano with 10 children. Masha'Allah. He's driving a taxi in KL. Whereas he should be in Terragano with his 10 children. He cannot earn a livelihood in Terragano, it's in KL. So this is how Dajjal causes the, the countryside to become vacant. And all of mankind moving towards the cities. And today he has succeeded to such an extent that we have what is called the mega cities. 20 million people in a city. Dajjal is rubbing his hands in happiness and glee because it's easier for him to control you. It is easier for him to brainwash you. It is easier for him to destroy your faith and also take your life if you're living in the big cities <coughs> and far far more difficult for him he gets a headache he needs Tylenol tablets when you're living in small communities scattered all over the remote countryside so that's the first thing we say and our strategy is to build Muslim villages in the remote countryside but in order to protect ourselves from those who would want to destroy us and make it as difficult as possible for them that they'll pay a terrible price if they come to destroy us. We say that in our Muslim village 
Only the Quran and the universally recognized Sunnah will be allowed in the masjid. If you have a religious practice, no matter how long you've had it, no matter how beneficial it may be, but it is not based on the Quran and not based on the universally recognized Sunnah. We say don't bring it into the masjid. Don't bring it into the public life of the village. You can keep it in private. And if anybody comes to your door to shout bid'ah and haram because of what you're doing in private, we will ship him out of that village faster than Federal Express. Because he's an agent of fitna. That's your private life. Your private life must be respected. <coughs> this is our strategy. So you cannot accuse us of any deviant practices. As it happened in Malaysia some time ago. I can't remember. Darul, Darul Alkam? Yes. Darul Alkam, yeah. You cannot accuse us of any deviant practices. Because we want to be as faithful as we can possibly be in fulfilling the Quran and the Sunnah to protect ourselves. The village would have dinar and dirham as money. And if you come with the police to seize our dinar and dirham, we will use rice as money. Plenty of rice in Java. Are you going to ban rice as well? How stupid can you be? Huh? We'll use sugar as money. But we're not going to use your bogus and fraudulent and haram paper money. Nor can you get us to use electronic money because we are outside of electronic range. In the perfect Islamic village you can't use a cell phone because we want to be outside of your range, your cell phone range. And because we are outside of your cell phone range, the radiation from the cell, power, cell towers won't reach us. So every woman looking for a husband, a husband who can give her a baby boy will come to our village because that's the only place she can find a husband who will give her a baby boy. All the rest of the men can give her only a baby girl. Why? Because the radiation has damaged the chromosomes. And so the male chromosomes are now too weak. And that's why the Prophet said والسلام, that in Akhiru Zaman, one man will have to maintain 50 women. What is the genealogy? The Prophet said والسلام, that the Imam will come from the seed. And he pointed to uh, Fatima, his daughter, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and his grandson, Sajjah, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. From them, the seed of Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he would be an Arab. So Indonesians don't qualify. <laughs> no. <laughs> he would be an Arab. <laughs> he would speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's his genealogy. Uh, but I am anticipating that the Israeli Mossad has already created an Imam al-Mahdi and the CIA. And as soon as Iran is attacked, uh, that manufactured Imam al-Mahdi is going to emerge. One has already emerged in Turkey. fellow has written large numbers of books and he's very popular on cable television and so on. Yeah. Uh, so you are going to have false Imam al-Mahdi's. The way you'll be able to recognize him is not by his genealogy. The way you'll be able to recognize him is that you have to wait for that Khalifa to die. And then there is disagreement concerning succession. And then a man will emerge out of Medina and hurry to Mecca. And then the people of Makkah will come out to him, so he's a well-known person. 
and urge him and force him to accept the bay'ah or the oath of allegiance <coughs> and he will do so at the Kaaba when he does that he will then himself proclaim that he is the Imam so when he proclaims himself the Imam at the Kaaba you will now be able to examine his credentials so if he proclaims himself to be the Imam in San Francisco the mother <laughs> don't bother or oh, Jakarta hmm? Mecca has never been a Shia city in the sense of being populated by Shia people let me repeat that because some people are hard of understanding Mecca has never ever been a Shia city in the sense of having a population that is overwhelmingly Shia never I do not anticipate a transformation of Mecca from a Sunni city to a Shia city from a non-Shia city to a Shia city and therefore I conclude that it is impossible for the people of Mecca to come out and give the bay'ah to an Imam al-Mahdi who proclaims himself to be Shia this is not any offensive statement to the Shia this is analysis it's not meant to hurt your feelings no let us be reasonable and let us discuss it on the basis of knowledge and therefore we conclude Imam al-Mahdi cannot be Shia it's not by genealogy that we recognize him but by these sequence of events <coughs> as soon as he proclaims himself to be the Imam <coughs> the Abdal from Sham and from Iraq would come to give the bay'ah to him the Hadith uses the word Abdal the Sufis have hijacked the word Abdal and given it a new strange connotation of a certain number of mysterious people who rule the world from behind the scenes we say no Abdal from Badal means one replacing the other and this refers to the Mujahideen those who are fighting fighting on the battlefield that our army is different from yours Uncle Sam in order for you to get people in your army you got to offer them green cards you got to offer them US citizenship you got to offer them houses and cars and university courses and all kind of thing but in our army anytime one dies another one replaces him and it'll never stop we have an inexhaustible supply every time one dies he's replaced by another replaced by another this is Abdal so they will come to Medina and give the bay'ah to him <coughs> when you see that happening it validates his claim and then an army is going to come to attack him from Sham and after that army crosses Medina on its way going down south to Mecca the earth is going to open and swallow that army that is the defining moment validating his claim to be the Imam not some eclipse in the sky the chronology of events that are going to occur before the Imam Ahmadi emerges it is better and safer for me to remain in territory that is well known than to venture into the unknown <laughs> I would suggest that you stay with this hadith pivotally important that when Jerusalem is booming with construction and Medina to Nabi is buildings are being destroyed and it is 
in a state of forlorn desolation. At that time, look for the great war, the Malhama. When the Malhama takes place, then look for the next event, the conquest of Constantinople. When the conquest of Constantinople takes place, then look for the next event, the release of Dajjal. This is a pivotally important hadith giving us a sequence of events in Akhiru Zaman. There's much more to be given, but I think we better stay with this. Uh, the question is, do we have a blueprint through which as an ummah we can respond successfully and appropriately at the collective level to the political, economic, monetary challenges of the age? We do have a blueprint, I said the Quran and the Sunnah. But you don't have people to implement it. Who are those who can implement it? The scholars. Blind can't lead the blind, can they? Are they equal those who possess knowledge and those who don't? Scholarship in this context begins with the Quran, not with a degree from MIT. MIT is the last place to go to study the Quran. Huh? Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. <coughs> the institutions of Islamic learning which teach the Quran and teach the Ahadith do not do so in a manner which will allow the Quran and the Ahadith to explain the reality of the world today. No, they don't. So the people who are graduating out of these institutions, the Maulanas, the Muftis, the Sheikhs, the Shuyukh, are at sea in respect of Dajjal's modern age and are responding to it consistently inappropriately. Look at Ikhwan al-Muslim Moon in Egypt. Look at Ikhwan al-Muslim Moon in Egypt. Or Nahla in Tunisia. Or the party in Turkey. <coughs> And so my answer is, we are incapable at this time, impossible, of responding successfully as a collective ummah. It's a hopeless cause, it will not succeed. You cannot overturn the existing political system, you cannot overturn the existing economy, you cannot overturn the existing monetary system. You cannot do it as an ummah, because the ulama have failed. If you think I'm wrong, go ahead and do it. Hezbollah Tahrir, go ahead and do it. I'm not stopping you. Well then, if we cannot succeed with a macro response, what else is there left but a micro response? I've been saying this for 15 years now. What is a micro response? The micro response is to go somewhere on Allah's earth. No matter how distant it may be, no matter how remote it may be, and go and establish the deen. Establish Islam, a small community in the remote countryside. And let people come and see this is Islam. The ruling party in Malaysia, the ruling party here, they can't do it. But you and I can do it. And guess what? Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran tells us this is the Surah of Il Mu'akhiru Zaman. Surah Al-Kahf. <coughs> I have the plan to write a quartet of books on Surah Al-Kahf. Quartet four. Alhamdulillah, I've written three already. The first book is the Tafsir, Surah Al-Kahf, the text, translation and commentary. We have it outside. The second book was the Ta'wil, interpretation, Surah Al-Kahf and the modern age, and that book answers your question. That when 
the young men in that city were faced with the shirk and could not overturn it instead of compromising they decided to withdraw and when they withdrew from the city they fled to a cave and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then preserved them for 300 years to send a message to us in Akhiru Zaman that if you also withdraw from a society which is sunk in shirk and in oppression remember what they're paying her they're paying her the wage of a slave the Indonesian maid <coughs> when you withdraw from that society and you withdraw to the remote countryside to build an authentic expression of the truth which has come from Islam Allah says Excuse me Allah will shower you with his mercy that's your guarantee an authentic expression of Islam at the micro level and Allah will protect you Allah will protect you <coughs> that Muslim village has to bring back authentic Islam she wanted to attend Salatul Jummah and I had to say to her I'm sorry women are not allowed they have enough money to build the twin towers but they can't build the masjid with enough space for women so women are not allowed in the masjid she said that's dangerous you're gonna pay a price for that tomorrow when you deny women the right to come to the masjid for prayer because Allah's messenger gave him that right so in our village we have a masjid where women can come to the masjid for Salatul Jummah as well and when she comes into the masjid Allah's messenger has said to her when you go down in sijda you must remain in sijda longer than the men did you know that? when last did any alim tell you that? why should you remain longer than the men because some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves properly and if you raise your head too soon it might be an unwelcome sight so there was no barrier women were at the back men at the front hmm? if you want to put the woman at the front and the men at the back you know what's going to happen none of the men will pray huh? so <laughs> women at the back and men at the front so the men could pray <laughs> and there's no barrier in between no partition in between no curtain in between none so men and women prayed in the same space not in two separate spaces so when the imam is on the member the woman can see her the woman can see him hmm? this is authentic Islam and when the salat is over the men keep sitting so that the woman can leave you don't leave at the same time this is Islam and this is what we recover in the Muslim village and if any woman comes to the village not all women are beautiful are they? not all women are young are they? any woman comes to the village and she says I want a husband somebody will have to marry her rather somebody will have to offer to marry her she has the right to accept or not to accept hmm? but somebody has to offer to marry her so if you say well I don't want my husband to take another wife 
Because your head has not as yet been able to bow down before Allah and His Messenger. No. That arrogant, stubborn, obstinate head of yours refuses to bow to the Quran. Then we say, stay where you are, don't come to the village. Because you'll only corrupt our village. So nearly all the men in this village are going to have more than one wives. So if you are comfortable and happy with a single wife now, it's more convenient eh? to have one wife, less expensive as well. That's going to go when you come to the village. Because we are going now into a world in which women are going to outnumber men. And a woman has the right, among the different rights that Allah has given to her, one of the rights that she has is a right to a husband. <coughs> to maintain her, to guard and protect her. So we, <coughs> we will try to restore the deen as it has come from Allah and his messenger. And to the extent that we are sincere and courageous in doing that, defying the godless world out there, then Allah's protection will be with us. So we do have a blueprint, but we don't have the people to implement it at the macro level. My opinion. And if a macro response is not possible, then my answer is micro response. Thank you. What comment do I have to make on events taking place in Sudan at this present time? The target is Egypt. The target is Egypt. Why is Egypt the target? <laughs> because someone changed the Torah and wrote into the Torah that the Holy Land extends from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. So that entire part of Egypt from the river Nile to the Red Sea it's called the Eastern Delta, belongs to Israel. <coughs> the reason why they put this as part of the Holy Land is because the Jews lived in the Eastern Delta for a few hundred years when Joseph, Nabi Yusuf Islam, was in Egypt. In order for Israel to take the Eastern Delta, you need more than simply an aerial attack and bombardment. You need a ground invasion. You need a ground invasion. But Egypt is a big country. And Egypt will respond ferociously. <coughs> so you need a multi-pronged attack on Egypt. And that's why, that's why they got this bogus Zionist Jihad. This bogus Zionist Jihad to infiltrate into Lib Libya to overthrow the Libyan government. And don't come to me with this rubbish that I am a supporter of Gaddafi. Take that rubbish and throw it into a garbage bin. I've never been a supporter of Gaddafi. And I'm not a supporter of him now. So take that rubbish and throw it into a garbage bin. The Zionist Jihad from Saudi Arabia, that version of Islam, entered into Libya, supported and armed by Turkey, supported and armed by Saudi Arabia and Qatar and by the Zionists and by NATO, to overthrow the regime in, in Libya. And when they succeeded, Libya became a NATO state. You can't get NATO out of Libya for the next 25 years. So when the attack is launched on Egypt, There'll be a ground invasion from the east, Israel. There'll be a ground invasion from the west, Libya. NATO will attack from the west. And what about the south? <coughs> what about the south? Now you can understand why they went fishing in the south. Fanning the flames, fanning the flames of sectarian warfare in Sudan actively intervening the Anglo-American Alliance and the Zionists actively intervening in southern Sudan to fan the flames of sectarian warfare and then finally forcing upon the government in Sudan 
to do what it just did. So Southern Sudan is now an independent state. So when the attack is launched, you have to destabilize Northern Sudan or Sudan. And so the attack is going to come from all three sides, ground invasion. From the south, from the east and from the west. And from the Mediterranean you have a, a naval blockade and naval bombardment. I don't see how Egypt can even stand a chance. Is it possible at the macro level <coughs> to overturn the existing monetary system of paper currencies, which of course is on its way out? As soon as war breaks out, the US dollar is going to collapse. But I have been saying that for more than 15 years now. Where did I get that knowledge? That the US dollar is going to collapse. And that when it collapses, it's going to bring down the entire monetary system of paper money that came out of Bretton Woods. Where did Imran Hussein get that knowledge? Was it an angel whispering in my ear? Was it a jinn whispering into my ear? Wake up! It was Islamic eschatology. I wasn't looking into the future. Only Allah knows the future. So don't come with that kind of criticism against me. I analyzed based on Islamic eschatology and I came to this conclusion. Why can't you do the same? We are now on the verge of that moment when the US dollar will collapse. The last time I heard about it was an ICU in a hospital in Washington about to die. And when the US dollar collapses, it's going to bring down the world of paper money. There's going to be panic in the soft currency areas of the world. People dumping their Indonesian rupiah and dumping their Pakistani rupee and dumping their taka as fast as they can because the price of bread is rising four or five times a day. Runaway inflation. Hmm? So rather than be caught with paper money that can only be used as wallpaper, let's dump it as fast as we can so that it makes way for electronic money. And electronic money is meant to function as the equivalent of a financial Guantanamo. That's a horrendous future awaiting us. An evil, horrendously evil future awaiting us. My response is I don't think it is possible at the macro level to overturn that system unless and until you can create a new world of Islamic scholarship who can lead the Ummah. If a macro response is not possible, what do we do? Go back home and eat roti chanai and drink te tarik and go to sleep? My response is, if the macro is not possible, let's do the micro. So at least we'll take this to us, with us in the grave. That we have done what is within our capacity. So in the micro, in the Muslim village you have a micro market. And in that micro market we will not allow this bogus money. We will not be using electronic money. <coughs> when we trade with the outside world we cannot avoid it. But within the, the Muslim village itself we try as much as we can to be faithful to Allah and His Messenger. That's the only response I have. But in Surah Al-Taghabun Allah says, Ittakullaha mastata'atum Fear Allah to the extent that you have capacity to do so. So Allah does not call upon us to do that which lies beyond our capacity. So within this context in which the world of Islamic scholarship has failed and failed miserably and embarrassingly, this is the only alternative that we have.
We're here on this special day. Our hearts are full of pleasure. A day that brings the two of you.